Welcome back to Tying That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, even though he's a little grumpy this night, Ty Frank. How's it going, man? It's not night here. <laughs> it's, it's still daylight out here. Oh, it's night here. It looks like it's night when I look through your thing. Do you have windows in there? You probably don't. You live like a vampire in a... Uh... Fortunately, because it's finally getting done, my house is being painted inside. So all the blinds have been taken off the walls, you know, so uh-huh. they can paint. Normally that blind is down and I keep the room as black as a cave. But but didn't you just get new windows, like replace all your windows? Yeah. Now we're having the inside of the house painted. So uh, this has been a two-year project, man. Yeah. This has taken a long time. It's what you get when your wife is an engineer. Yeah, that is the downside to being married to an architect and an engineer. An architect and an engineer. Um, yeah. she has, she has many thoughts on the way things should look. So. Yeah. I mean, look, when we were building our house at the time, I, I, I remember talk, we, she, we talked forever. She has endless ideas that come out and you need to do it this way and you do it. And she's very much from a holistic perspective and really conscious of the materials you use and yeah. certain things like that. And I was like, Oh my, I didn't even think about that. And that's probably explains a lot. You know, maybe I ate a lot of lead paint when I was growing up or something. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> The, uh, not the only one. I mean, the place looks great. They finished painting the outside. It looks fantastic. I'm sure when the inside yeah. gets painted, it'll look fantastic. And, and we, we fixed some drainage issues because uh, yeah. building your house on the side of a, of a cliff, you got to worry about the drainage, apparently. Were you the first owners of the house? No, no. It's, it's like 20 years old, but uh, it was time to augment some of the drainage coming down uh-huh. off the side of the hill and stuff. What uh, did you do? I don't was know. It just, was it they, just grading or did you put it in like a culvert? I don't know. They do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about Billy Shatner? William Shatner going up into space with our, probably our best. Would you say that Jeff Bezos is our best friend? I would say that he feels more like family at this point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Jeff. Yeah. He, he is our, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't or, or JB J- as we call him, you know? Yeah. He loves it when we call him JB. JB. Yeah. That, that's pretty exciting. Now, I didn't, did it, it happen today, right? I didn't read anything about it. Did it all go well? Is, uh, yeah, I mean, he made it back. He didn't die. So, um, And I assume, because it's Captain Kirk going into space, I assume he also made out with a sexy android while he was up there. Uh, yeah. That's, that's what Captain Kirk does. You know, we had that idea, and we actually, you know, we talked to Bezos about it, is that um, we would want to be the first show where you actually shoot on location and actually shoot a scene in space. Now, yep. to be able to do that, it would probably cost more money than a whole season put together. Yes. And I'm it sure might it not would. really add that much to the production value, but just to say we did it, you know? That's a yeah, he didn't, he didn't want to give us the free ride. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to see him in March, so I'm going to bug him about that and say um, yeah. we should definitely do the first podcast in space. In we'll space. do tying that guy up in space. Um, is he coming to stay with you and the family? And- no, uh, no. Uh, he's got a conference that he does every mm-hmm. year and. We were supposed to go to it last year, but they canceled it because of COVID, of course. So this uh, is, I think, the makeup conference. Right. So this is really cool. Uh, Steven and I were at New York Comic Con. We had a, a great time. And uh, what was really cool is, you know, these are not our shirts. People are finding, the, you know, these are fan-made shirts, but people are walking up with tying that guy's shirts on at Comic Con, and they come up to me. And, and I said, if you had a tying that guy's shirt, and you hand me a question, we'll answer on the show. And I thought this was a really fun question. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for, for your shirt and your support of the, the podcast. Um, that means a lot to us. And her question, it was worded a little bit different, but I think, you know, she was rushed and everything. But so I will, I will uh, summarize the question. So basically, and this is probably more to you, um, but if, if Han Solo was a character that existed in the Expanse universe, what? <laughs> How would you incorporate him in the story, and what would his arc be? <laughs> <laughs> now, this come is on, a, this Melanie, is, come on. <laughs> this is something that I think this is a fun question, but it's something you would have to think about. But imagine if you take Han Solo and you put him in the Expanse world, how would he function in the in the Expanse well, world? Well, I mean, if he's if he's just a smuggler, then I guess you know there are there are smugglers out there. Um. He would be OPA for sure, right? You think? Sure. Yeah. Or, or he wouldn't have any affiliation. Yeah, I don't think he, he would be affiliated. I think he'd be. No. I think he'd be an independent operator with his own busted ass little ship. 
Yeah, he would and, be well because the because the Millennium Falcon couldn't exist in this universe because no. it you know we don't have that you know it's a different universe. Yeah, so he'd, he'd have some busted ass little like you know sh- freighter, but yeah, it would be would, the fastest. Be, it would be the it would be a, a well, shitty. F- he would, tell, freighter, he, but it would, he would the, tell people it was the fastest. I don't know if it actually would be. Isn't the Millennium Falcon the fast, fastest ship in the galaxy, or is that just him? Like, how, how, how would you know? Like, all the ships seem to go the same speed in that world. Um, yeah, I, I actually think that would be fun, because he would, he would have a shitty-looking freighter, and it would be, he, he would claim that it was the fastest ship in the, in the solar system. Yeah. And he would just be... Smuggling shit from OPA to to Mars to Earth, he'd be running it all, and they would all be after him. Yep. And then who would be who would be the bounty hunter? They probably send uh, they probably send the Rossinate after him, right? Back in Rossinate's making money days, like what if the uh, I don't the, I don't know that I don't know that the Rossi ever went after uh, smugglers. I think the only the, only ships that Fred ever hired them to go after were actual pirates, and I I don't yeah. think I don't think. Uh, at least Are what we know of pirates. Of, I don't. I, well, not really. They're not the same thing. I don't think what we know of Han Solo included much uh, actual piracy. Yeah, I, he felt a little piratey, piratey to me. Yeah, but I, I can't see him shooting up somebody else's ship and stealing their stuff. Right. Yeah. All right. So that there you have it, Melanie. Thank you for your question. Han Solo would uh, have a super fast frigate that was looked very shitty, but it actually ran good. And he's actually a good pilot. He's got a lot of talent at that. And he would be smuggling water and and shit like that to the OPA, to Mars, to Earth, uh, and and uh, there would be. Let's see, I'm not sure who they would send. At. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. No, I, I know who Han Solo is in the in the Expanse universe. Han Solo is that guy from Episode One that Avasarala hangs on hooks because he was because sm- <laughs> he was because he was smuggling stealth composites to uh, the OPA. And it, it looks and, and when he's wet, it looks very similar when he becomes unfrozen. Yeah, uh, there you go. That thing. All right, there you go, Melanie. Um, okay, this this is from Christy. Christy, I love your shirt, and I actually saw you in in New Jersey with your shirt, and you wore it to New York. Um, it says, how has the Expanse changed you? Um, well, the Expanse, I think, has changed me. Um, I feel more relaxed. Uh, I guess one way it's changed me is I feel more relaxed within my career because I feel so grateful that I got to be a part of a show and work with pe- people of this caliber and with such an endlessly fascinating character. And I feel creatively satisfied and I feel less pressure um, because I feel like I've done something that I'm truly proud of. Um, and I feel like I can relax a little bit and, uh, and you don't, and just, ha- you don't have to rush out and take the next terrible movie somebody offers you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks Christy. And I appreciate your support and you guys had beautiful shirts. And by the way, these are shirts that they made. We didn't, uh, these are not from us or anything like that. So, um, Thank you guys. But you know what's cool is so we're doing this panel at New York Comic Con and the panel was packed. And uh and I mentioned every Comic Con, you know, but I I mentioned Ty and that guy and everybody screamed. It was like they were like, "Ah," you know, cuz I said, you know, Ty and I started this it, it was connected to another question. I said, "We started this podcast." And everybody goes, "Ah, Ty and that guy." And it was a cool it was a cool thing. It was a cool nice. thing. Yeah. And I love it when people bring our inside jokes around you know that's that's fun so what are we talking about today uh this is fallen world right dan noack and jennifer pong directed by jennifer pong written by Mm -hmm. dan noack friend of the show dan noack good friend of the show this is one episode this was a an interesting episode for me because we only had a, a couple of scenes and so i really showed up during this whole shoot for a half day at the very last day of the episode so it was kind of fun to watch because I don't remember any of this. I don't remember. I don't know if I've seen it or any of this. But one of the things that I love about the Expanse is leave it to the Expanse to make Newton's Law of Motion the antagonist of this episode. <laughs> you know, I mean, just this situation and uh, the physics and science of what happened to them when they stopped in the aftermath of that. That's what makes the Expanse special, and that was interesting to me. It was surprising. It's kind of like we talked about your buddy. Ted Chang and how he made science so interesting 
in his book, the story of, is it the story of our lives? The story of your life. The story, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Ted Chang, the story of your life. <laughs> and I, and, but when, you know, that book, you read it and he goes way into depth of, you know, language and, and how that shapes your brain and yeah. how it, you, it molds the way you think. And it's just fascinating. It's captivating. So then you would think, oh, you know, this is, these people just stop really fast and a lot of shit happened. It's like, is that interesting? But it was really interesting. It was, and, and horrific also at the same time. How did Bobby, was it just a hunch? How did she determine the new speed limit? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of a hunch. You know, she saw, they, they fired the bullets and at a certain point the bullets got stopped. So, and obviously everybody had seen previously what happened to Maneo when he went through the ring the first time and got splattered. That was solar system wide news. So everybody knew, knows that things slow down. And when the Rossi had gone into the ring, it slowed down before it went in and the torpedo didn't. And so you have that moment at the end of a previous episode where the Rossi can still move around, but the torpedo that was chasing it got grabbed. Mm. And when the lieutenant, by the way, played by uh, Simu Lu. Anyway, so when, when uh, Simu Lu, who plays, uh, I forget his lieutenant something, I forget what the character's name is. But he throws a grenade, it sets it off, a bunch of stuff happens in the space that they're in. She just has this hunch, like, we should be really careful that firing bullets and throwing grenades in here didn't have the same effect that uh, Maneo flying through the ring had, and just double checks it. So, fires that RPG up, tracks the speed at which it gets grabbed, and then you now you know what the speed limit is. And you got old Stevie Strait that is shook up, man. He is all shook up, like Elvis yeah. Presley. It, was it like a, 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 a synapse all firing at once situation or was it yeah. the, the trauma of him witnessing the, the rise and fall of civilization? Like it, what, what is happening? It was, to it was a big download. It was like a right. huge data dump into his brain. It was more than his mind could handle. So mm -hmm. he, you know, knocked him out. And, uh, you know, he had that hollow, faraway stare in his eyes. And you know another time of that hollow, faraway stare? When, when was that? That was when me and you went drinking one night. You oh, yeah. That night? <laughs> I do remember that night. Well, I mean, I remember parts of that night. Now, I have been accused in the past of being a person who sometimes brags. Uh, but I would say that my positive quality is that I never brag about shit that isn't true. Like, right. I, 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 like I, it's, it's always truthful. Right. And I have, I, I, up until I met Wes, I had never met anybody who could drink me under the table. <laughs> And, and I've taken on some strong competition. I mean, the first time Terry McDonough, the mad Irish director, and I hung out, yeah. he decided to turn it into a drinking contest, yeah. and I put him on his ass. So I've, yeah. I've gone up against some strong competition. Yeah. But uh, the first time Wes and I went and hung out, and it was just like we were going to... No, just we've, we've hung out before. We were, we were no, pals no. at this point. When we went to the tequila place? Yeah, we, we, hung, we hung out a few times. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, but it was. We we decided we were going to. It was. It, it it was one of those things that was a Friday night, and you were right. like, "Let's go for it." And you told me, and you were, you know, you told me that, you know, it's like we're going to do it. Let's do it. Let's try all these tequilas and everything like that. Yeah. And you were talking about like, now I got to warn you, I drink people on the table, and I was like, Ty, I come from a long line of alcoholics. <laughs> you know, I was in. The, <laughs> yeah, like, I got. I got this. But to be honest. I was really impressed. I mean, I thought, I was like, after this bar, he's not going to make it through. And you, I was like, oh, look at Ty going through the thing, you know? <laughs> but once we, once we circle back to the scotch bar after the tequila tasting room, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's when Ty lost all motor control, yeah. all sense of language, of eyes and everything. It was gone. Yeah, it was gone. And Ty, do you feel comfortable going into the story or? Should well, we? I, I don't want to. I don't want to go into too many details. Like, oh, okay, all I don't. Right, I don't want right, to go right. to the part where you and I wound up making out. I don't. That all let's right, not go that right. far. Okay. Um, <laughs> but there was a moment. I will just say this: is when I was like, "Okay, Ty, we're taking you home," and <laughs> and I said, "What hotel are you staying at?" We walked by the Soho, and you're like, <laughs> and I was like, "What?" You go, Rrr! and you pointed at this hotel, and you were pissed off at me because I couldn't understand you. <laughs> So I drag you into this hotel and we go <laughs> and we go to the front desk and I'm like, hey, uh, Ty, stay in here. But I can't I don't know what room he's in. I can't understand him. What is Ty Frank's thing? And she so she looks it up and, and you're going Rawr! like like I think in your mind you're saying, oh, this is my room number. This is where we go. And you're like, Rawr! 
And so, and so she looks up and she's like, um, and I go, there's no, and I was like, she goes, there's no Ty Frank. And you go, and then you said, and then you go, and then you said the, the floor number. And she's like, we don't have a 15th floor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cause, cause I was up in like the 21st floor of that the other 21st building. Floor. And, and we the realized Soho that has like four floors. And I realized at that point you took me to the wrong hotel. <laughs> And then, and then we had to go back, go the other toe. I, I will say that was one of the the funnest nights I've had on the Expanse. That was such a good time, and, uh, and it was such a good sport. The main takeaway from that is don't try to drink West under the table. <laughs> no, don't, don't. don't. I don't do it. I don't have any talents or qualities or anything, but I, I can drink. Well, it's <laughs> it's a Navy tradition, right? Exactly. You're exactly, a former Navy you know. man. I should have. Former I should Navy have known man, better. and I and I come from a long line of military and uh, and and dysfunctional alcoholics. So it's you know it's uh, I <laughs> I've been primed. I was well, ready for it. My grandfather, who was a Navy man, when he married my grandmother, and he's my step grandfather. He wasn't my mom's real dad, but, right. but when he married my my grandmother, uh, apparently he was a man who put away a prodigious amount of booze, and right. she said, "I'll marry you." But you got to stop drinking. And it was that was the last drink he ever took. He was just like, right. All right. Uh, but before that, apparently he he had uh, quite a quite a capacity. So I have great yeah. respect for Navy men on the. Well, I, front. I, I, I think it was that night. I mean, it was some because, you know, like soon after that, I stopped drinking for like a year and a half. Yeah. And trust me, what... I stopped drinking for about a month after that. <laughs> I had to, I had to detox, man. I just yeah. I was just drinking like a gallon of water every day trying to clear uh, out my bloodstream. It was such a fun night. It was a good time. Okay, so Anna is kind of taking the audience's point of view because she's never been a zero G. So when and I think this is a great scene, and I like it when he when she comes in the room and she's like, "Look, I can help these people." And he and he said, "There's nothing you can do for these people." And she's like, "What are you talking about? You just get a few sutures." And she goes, he's like, "Have you ever been a zero G?" And the realization of that these people, it's basically a death sentence with this internal bleeding. Walk me through a little bit of, of what that, so what happens is, is if you're bleeding internally, you have no way to stop the blood and it, it, well, it's, I mean, obviously we're speculating a little bit there and there's different opinions on this, but the, uh, this was a thing that Daniel had looked up that so much of how our, our body's, uh, waste reclamation works depends on gravity that, mm-hmm. that when blood pools in a cavity in your body, part of what helps your body flush that out and, and get rid of it is the action of gravity on your body. You know, we, we evolved in gravity. So many of our systems re, like rely on gravity. And you'll notice if you, if you look at astronauts who've been up in space a long time, they get very puffy. Um, mm-hmm. Their faces get very puffy because their body just has a harder time getting the fluid out of the tissues than it normally would. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the idea there is that if, you, if a bunch of blood is collecting in a cavity in your body, Part of the system that helps get rid of that blood just isn't working because Mm -hmm. uh, there's no gravity pulling on the blood. You know, in the same way that an astronaut gets very puffy when they're in space, you would just, those cavities in your body would just swell up with that blood that isn't getting drained away. So going back to alcohol, have you heard anybody ever talk about the experience of drinking in space? And Uh, I wonder. I don't think any NASA astronauts have ever taken booze up into space with them. But I'm sure the Russians. I I was just about to say, I bet the Russians took some vodka up there. I bet they did. Um, I, I, I haven't wonder read what, about it. I wonder what the, and I'm sure we have uh, one of our eight, um, you know, ha- has knowledge to this effect, but I wonder what the effect would be, you know, with drinking in space, like the yeah. alcohol and the blood and how that would mingle or whatever. And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, altitude has a huge effect on your, ability. Oh yeah. Um, cause I know when I lived in Albuquerque, which is over a mile high, I mean, Al- Albuquerque is higher than Denver is. It's, it's really mm-hmm. high. People don't know that. Mm-hmm. So people would come visit there, and we'd go up to Santa Fe, which is over 7,000 feet. So that's pretty high. Oh, Santa Fe, yeah. Yeah, so we'd go to Santa Fe. We'd go to, I think you went there with us when we had the premiere yeah. the Mexican restaurant. Yeah, I loved yeah. it down there. Yeah. yeah, I had a great time there. The New Mexican restaurant that I always take people to is in Santa Fe, and we'd go there, and we'd have a bunch of food. And one of the things they have is they have an incredibly extensive margarita menu. Mm-hmm. So everybody's like, oh, i got to try all these margaritas. And, and they make them strong there. They're not frat girl margaritas where they're like blended with like <laughs> with like strawberry juice and bullshit yeah. like that these are real yeah. margaritas right and people would be drinking a bunch of them and they would just get destroyed yeah. because they're from like portland which is at sea level and they yeah. can drink three margaritas at portland yeah. you can't drink three margaritas at seven thousand feet so i yeah. gotta think in a low pressure environment 
like you would be on like the space station or something. Yeah. The alcohol would have to hit you hard, right? Yeah. You would yeah. think. I wonder if people have had sex up there and what that's like. Well, Shatner certainly did. Yeah. I can't wait to talk to Shatner and, and see what it was like. Yeah. I'm, I'm certain he got it because Shatner yeah. has never been to an alien planet or without having sex without getting laid that's never it's a, happened it's a it's an intergalactic law yeah the the u.s space program the nasa space program and even now that we've got these sort of commercial space programs coming up they're all very kind of military and cut and dry and very straight laced yeah the Russians is like the Wild West, especially yeah, like, that. That's where all those experiments are happening. Yeah, we, yeah. I, I mean, we, the, if the Russian space what? program, anything goes. Even though JB is like family to us, we might want to go up with the Russians because I think they're going to bring alcohol. People are going to be having sex. Yeah, you know that's the way it goes. I but I wonder what that is like. And you know what? Like I, I <laughs> you know, instead of the Mile High Club, soon you're going to join the Ten Thousand Mile High Club. Yeah. So Anna finds Tilly. And Tilly says that it was your fault that I'm in the situation because I tried to help. I tried to, you know, be this thing. I tried to help and this happened. Now I got a pipe going through my chest and, and Clarissa tried to kill me. And what I really loved about this is that Anna's like, he, she, she's like, you need to find Clarissa. And Anna, who's a pastor, who's sweet and loving, she goes straight and gets an, a nightstick. <laughs> and she trashed Clarissa down. And I was like, oh, she gonna like if she has to, she would crack Clarissa over the head with that. Well, stick. it's a it's a it's a stun, you know, it's like oh. a cattle prod kind of thing. It's got a electrical stun thing. Oh, I thought it was like a yeah, police well, nightstick. And, no, and that's why that's why later in the episode when she uses it on Clarissa's mechanical suit that she's wearing, you see it short the suit out. It's because she hits her with a big Wait, charge of You just gave away a spoiler. Yeah, spoiler. She shorts it out. Yeah. So Naomi gets to the Rossinante and she walks around and she, uh, you know, I, I feel like at times like she's the house mother and Steven's the dad. <laughs> and, and so she kind of, and, and uh, Amos and Alex are like the two dysfunctional, you know, sons. Yeah. Um, but she goes through and, and uh, there's a really nice moment between her and Amos when he's like, are you, and there's a childlike quality because he's just in this semi unconscious state and he says are you with us for good are you gonna are you coming home are we gonna be in this thing and they haven't had a real connection yeah. you know since they're falling out before and i thought that was a really nice moment and then she goes down the hangar bay and she runs into sigourney weaver <laughs> in, in the goliath suit yep um what uh were you inspired by that were you no. you guys was the writer's room inspired by that that's that mechanical fight no, that's actually that's actually from the books. Um, oh, okay. That these were the that, books inspired by that. Uh, not consciously, but of course, I'm a uh -huh. huge fan of Alien and Alien, so I'm sure they unconsciously inspire me in everything. But um, the idea there is that you would have, you know, like the Goliath suit makes the the Martian Marines stronger. There would be commercial uses for that, where you'd have mm -hmm. basically the space version of. Uh, you know, some device for tearing things apart. We in the book we call it a, a demolition mech. You know, it's for mm -hmm. grabbing two pieces of metal, tearing them apart, that kind of thing. That's the idea behind it. Is that mm -hmm. she's she's gotten one of those. People have asked about that scene because Clarissa tears her way into the ship, and people are like, well, why isn't Naomi? Why why is there air in in the in the uh, cargo bay once Clarissa's torn her way in there? And and the piece that the people who ask that question are missing is that Clarissa has attached a bubble airlock to the outside of the, the airlock doors. It's just like a little bubble of plastic that acts like an airlock so that you can get into the ship. Um, and that's the thing that she stole, that square thing that she's holding when she flies toward the ship, is this like inflatable airlock. And you see that show up again in season five, that same kind of bubble airlock when they rescue Monica. Yeah, from the container. Do you guys think that everybody that watches this is in Mensa? Like, <laughs> I mean, the things that you expect these poor watchers to put together is just, uh, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, I'm a part of the show, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, our, one thing that Daniel and I have been accused of in our writing uh -huh. is sometimes being a little too subtle with stuff like that. Right. Um, but, you know, I actually prefer that. I prefer a show that doesn't hand feed me all the answers where I agree. On I agree. A, on a rewatch, I can go, oh, that's what was going on there. That's why that thing didn't happen. Yeah, I prefer that. 
I like struggling a little bit to try to figure out what's going on. To me, that pulls me in more. It makes it more engaging and fun. If I'm watching and it's all spoon fed to me, I get, I just get kind of bored and, yeah. and zone out of it. So, well, and that's and and people are used to that on TV, which is why most people watch TV now with their phone in their hand because yeah. the yeah. show is spoon feeding them everything they need. They don't even have to look at the screen. They're you know playing around on their phone or whatever. Yeah. Our show doesn't do that. We're we're a really bad phone show. Yeah. So I, at the end of season five, when Amos was bringing, because I, I don't remember this episode. I don't, I don't think I've seen this episode, the fight that they have at the end. But when Amos was bringing Clarissa back on the ship, I didn't realize just how big of an ask <laughs> it was to bring Peaches on the Rocinante. When I, went, when I saw this fight watching this episode, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't believe Naomi let this, this girl back on. <laughs> She's literally trying to kill her. But, uh, I mean, how big of Captain Holden to let her back on the ship? I mean, that is, that's trust. That's, that's love amongst the crew. And she has, uh, I mean, clearly she has changed dramatically between then and now. They but just they haven't don't know that they when don't they know let that. it slide. Yeah. yeah. They haven't seen that. Amos has seen that. Amos has yeah. seen the change. They haven't. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there is a lot of trust there for them to just kind of let him do that. Yeah. For sure. I don't know if I would have been as forgiving. As uh, as they were, I damn sure know Ty wouldn't have been. <laughs> Ty wouldn't have been as forgiven as they were. All right, so now we see Drummer and Ashford being trapped under Mormon tractors and trying. You know, uh, and then they're bonding. They're getting to know each other. They have this great thing. But did you ever see Cat's Eye when James Wood was trying to quit smoking? And uh, it was it was a movie. It was called Cat's Eye, and it was an anthology movie. And yeah. James Wood. And James Woods was trying to quit smoking. So he goes to this agency and, and basically it's like, you know, pay some money. And they're like, trust me, you're not going to smoke again. And they lit. And then he's like, signs up and he's like, okay, let's see. And then he ends up slipping and smoking and they like kidnap his wife and like torture him and torture her <laughs> and everything. And then, it, you know, at the end he stops smoking and, uh, and he's like, you know, happy and everything to them. But, and, and it's like a real bizarre, it was this, is this thing. I, I, I love it. It's this thing called cats. I really enjoyed it. It came on. Anyway. So it made me think is like, what if there was a like a not like a couples retreat or or a work retreat? Where people are just not getting along, and you're like, well, come on, we'll we'll make you guys once you're done with this, we'll get along. And then you trap them in some kind of like where they know they they're real they they think they're about to die, and you do like these extreme like have them hanging off a mountain or something, and then they have to bond or get along, you know, do our Twilight Zone or Cat's Eye version of that kind of <laughs> camp of these people force these people to get together, but. Drummer ultimately sacrifices herself because she knows that the crew needs a captain. And where she is, she's not going to be able to get out, so she wants to save Ashford so they can go and the crew can have a captain. And it's a, it's a really beautiful moment between them, and, uh, and it's a way that they start to really develop trust with each other for the first time. And, and it's a great relationship-building scene. Yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, that scene doesn't work if you don't have – Actors of the caliber of Karaji and David Strathairn. Yeah. I mean, they really elevate that moment to what it, what it becomes just because they're so good. And you can sense the sort of grudging respect that's growing between the two of them and still the underneath the animosity that's still there. The way that, that they sort of go through that roller coaster of like, oh, we're about to get out. Oh, it didn't work. And, and the I was going to give you shit about that. When I saw her telling him how to do the arm and then get the, get the, the device. And it was going to bring me back. Cause I didn't know what, where it went. And yeah. I was, and then they caught it and I was like, come on, Ty, like what they, they reach out and they get the thing and now they're out, but then it shattered. And I was like, Oh, Oh, okay. Now this is interesting. Yeah. I mean, and, and it lets them sort of have a little bit of an emotional roller coaster there that they're on mm -hmm. together. Uh, right. Cause they, they need all of that so that when they get to the moment where drummer says, one of us has to get out of this alive. I don't see any way that it can be me, but I do see a way it can be you and makes that decision like we arrive at that place with her that, you know, they, they've had enough time together that she that we understand why she gets to that place. So Asher, his first order on the uh, when he goes up to the bridge is to to basically open up the behemoth to take care of all the injured people because yeah. they have the capacity to do that. Yeah. And what do you think motivated that move? It, that's the thing is I think Ashford is absolutely genuine when he's talking to drummer in earlier scenes uh, in earlier episodes about how 
the belters need to be accepted as a nation. They need to be accepted as a, as a civilized people that can sit at the same table with the governments of Earth and the governments of Mars. I think he believes that's true. And I think, you know, he, uh, later in a later episode, he'll talk about making the world better for the children that follow. And, you know, because we've learned that he was a father and, and, and all that. And I, I think all of these things are true. And so he sees an opportunity to reach out his hand in a generous move to people that are up from another nation. It's such a, a more effective way to earn the respect and your rightful place amongst these other nations and, and power and to do it in a way by helping, yeah, by using your facilities and bringing that in to help them as opposed to trying to dominate each other, which is usually the, how the game is played. And a large part of military missions, uh, particularly the U.S. military, is humanitarian. You know, there, there's a humanitarian missions that that you know that never really get talked about in the school buildings and the 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 medical uh delivering medical supplies and giving medical support to certain countries and certain things like that and that's really an effective way to gain the respect i mean you know there's also we also do a lot of other bad things but it's no it's funny that you brought that up because i was just watching a video about the newest generation of you know the the kind of aircraft carrier you served on the newest mm-hmm. generation of that ship. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what the name of the ship was. I'm, tr- I'm racking my brain trying to remember, but it's the brand new one. And they give like a tour of it. And, and, mm-hmm. and we're meeting like some of the officers who serve mm-hmm. on it, like the XO. And, and we meet uh, a lieutenant who's in charge of the medical part of that ship. And they talk, she talks about the fact that they have 10 operating rooms. And a huge part of what they can do is they can go to a country that's in trouble and they can just be a floating hospital. Are you talking about the Essex, the USS Essex? Y- yeah, Essex. but it's the, it's the newest it's the newest generation of that. The Mercy? Uh, Have you heard of the no. Mercy? No, I haven't heard of the Mercy. Uh, so, but the Essex had this state of the art, massive hospital on board. Yeah, and we we did a lot of stuff with utilizing this equipment and helping people and and uh, you know and certain things like that. Also, we helped a lot of drunken sailors that were out on that before and getting them hydrated and things like that. But, um, but to your point though, that, that is, yes, it's a military ship and it can have, you know, F 35s and Apache gunships or whatever can land on it. But the other thing that can land on it is, is like emergency ambulance helicopters and they can operate as a hospital. And so when you try to win a war, there's multiple ways to do that. And one of the ways is the one you're talking about. You, you win the war by winning over the people. And that's mm-hmm. what Ashford is trying here. It's like, I'm, I'm, yes, I, I have an advantage because I can create gravity on my ship and you can't. So I have, that gives me an advantage. And I could use that to try to dominate you militarily. Or I can offer that advantage to you with open hands and win you over that way. And that's what Ashford is trying to do. There's this interesting, that's connected to this, there's this interesting YouTube clip that was based, it was based off an, an essay, but there's a guy that goes through and breaks down the masculinity of Aragorn yeah. off of, uh, uh, and, you know, and basically Tolkien's, he's like his pure expression of masculinity and the way that he conducts himself and the way that uh, he has spent, he's dedicated himself to discipline and strength, but uses that strength for protection and to help people, but also the way that the, that he gains instead of like dominance or that he gains mutual respect with the people that he works for, that he works with, and that he um, is truly of service and he's humble and he only accepts that role of leadership when he feels that he can truly serve in the way that, and I don't know, it's, it's really interesting. It's a fascinating thing. Well, and there's, and to that point, there's a deleted scene that is in the extended version of uh, Return of the King where it shows him in what they have for their version of a hospital. And he's healing people. He's he's he oh, knows yes. about, he knows about what? herbs and things, and so he's in there and he's acting as like a healer. And they talk about the hands of the king should be a ha- the hands of a healer, and that fits in exactly with what you're talking about. That his is the greatness of him is not just his ability to kill. The greatness of him is his ability to protect and to heal. Yeah, and to lead. I, I always wanted that because the healing was a big part of his character in the book. Yeah, and they kind of left that out of the movies, but well, they actually he, shot a scene. When well, if you that? watch the extended version of Return of the King, there is a scene where he's in the Houses of Healing and he's applying bandages and, and he's actually healing um, Eowyn because, you know, she had her arm broken by the, by the Witch King with the, mm-hmm. with the big uh, flail. So he's in there, he's healing her arm 
and and they have a, a really nice scene there that you know they cut because of runtime but uh yeah so i i agree 100 percent with that i think that's a great example of it that power isn't just the ability to dominate and kill power is also the ability to protect and heal and bring people together yeah mm -hmm. and we forget that sometimes so uh in honor of ashford and drummer being locked in a confined space I thought our top five would be films that take place in a confined space. And thank God that the, uh, the list Nazi isn't here with us because we, uh, we got producer Joseph as opposed to uh, producer Clint because he is off uh, gallivanting with, uh, with his, I don't know, I don't know what he's doing. Probably he's actually, he's actually uh, shooting some stuff for uh, the new Mystery Science Theater. It's very exciting. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he's doing yeah. something. So he, so basically, he's doing something way more important yeah. than well, this I, thing. The, the difference is they actually pay him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I always find that, like, you know, whenever you want somebody to, to uh, really work hard for you, paying him is always a nice thing. They always seem to appreciate that. Yeah. You know? Well, they uh, prisoners with jobs, there's another word for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I bet... Ty, because you know me so well, I bet you could probably guess the, <laughs> the first movie on this list, movies that take place in a confined space. In a confined space. Well, are, are we talking confined space like a office building like Nakatomi Plaza? Like Is Nakatomi. That, I mean, exactly. if you can't leave, that's, you're confined to that building, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I bet you can guess the second one. Well, I mean... Is, confined is, space. It, is it confined space like a spaceship you can't get off of? Like <laughs> yep. uh, the Nostromo when uh, mm -hmm. an alien gets on board? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so we got Die Hard, Alien, Home Alone, Phone Booth, the Stanford Prisoner Experiment, The Mist. There's a lot of Stephen King on here. I mean, yeah. obviously, everybody knows what I think about King. Uh, Rear Window, The Martian, Moon, uh, Lifeboat, the Hitchcock Lifeboat movie, The Poseidon Adventure, Open Water, Castaway. Lord of the Flies, Buried. I didn't see this one. This was the one with Ryan Reynolds. Misery, Stephen King again. 127 hours. Alive, they are trapped, but is it a confined space? Well, I, I, I also don't think Castaway fits there because... All right, all right. He's, let's he's let trapped, me get through but... the list and then, <laughs> and, then we'll, and then we can criticize the list. I mean, I guess that means I Am Legend is not that. Uh, uh, I don't think so. The others is. They're confined to that house. Yeah. Yeah, okay, they're trapped so, in the house. Gerald's Game. Another Stephen King. Did you see the Gerald's Game movie? No, I didn't see the movie. Yeah. I'd like to, though. Is it good? The Gerald's Game movie is, is a fairly good King adaptation. Uh, Carla Gugino is in it, who I've always been a big fan of. Um, and it, really playing against type because she very often plays like tough people. Mm -hmm. um, she often plays tough women in, in Gerald's Game. She's, she's very playing against type, but she's just a great actress. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's not bad. I, I, I'm a huge fan of her, and, uh, you know, the first time I saw her was in Son-in-Law. Do you remember that movie with Polly Shore? No, I, I, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a Polly Shore movie. It was a movie that he did with Polly Shore. I, you know, it's, I'm not a huge fan of those movies, and it, it wasn't a great movie, but she, she made the movie. I saw the movie, and, uh, and she, was, she made the movie interesting. Also, yeah. she was, uh, what's that movie with uh, Rodriguez, um, Sin City? Yeah, Sin City. Um, she was great in that as well. This one is one, probably my, oh, it's definitely going to my top five is Cujo. Yeah. You know, that, that being trapped in that car, that movie shook me up. Uh, Panic Room. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, do you know the movie, it's like a South African movie where they're trapped in a house and there's, they're full of lions? Yeah. On the, it's called Roar. Roar. It's a famous, yeah. it's a famous movie because like, like a bunch of people got fucked up. Like, oh, yeah. It was, like, notorious for how dangerous it was. Like, yeah, stunt guys uh, were eating Tippi, and stuff. Tippi Hedren got her arm broken by an elephant. No, a leg. Excuse me. She got her leg broken by an elephant. Uh, yeah. Their kid, uh, who's a famous actress, uh, their daughter, got mauled by a lion, got her scalp ripped open. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that is a notorious film. They really went for it. And, and that's why it's so terrifying, because you look, you're like, these people are in real danger. Yeah. This is, these are real lions, and this is really happening. The scene where, um, the scene where Tippi Hedren gets her legs snapped is in the movie. You can watch it happen. When that elephant yanks her up by the leg with its trunk. Oh, my God. That is the moment her leg gets snapped, and it's still in the film. So is it fair to do Die Hard and Alien in the top five? Because, you know, 
That that's I mean, should we include that in top five or do we? Because I mean, yeah, well, you know what? You know what we should five. probably do here. I've been thinking about this a lot, and here's what we should probably do. So Isaac Asimov, when he had the the robot stories, he had the three laws of robotics, like the three laws that govern all robots in his stories. Then he realized that there was a more important law, and he created the zeroth law, like the letter the, the number zero law, which is over all the others. I think we should in our top fives, we should just have a zero. And we'll just plug Alien and Die Hard in there. So they're always in that zero spot. Okay. And then we'll just do the top five. I love that idea. I love it. <laughs> For me, Cujo is number one. What do you think about that? I think Cujo is one of the best trapped in a box movies ever made. It's mm-hmm. terrifying. It is terrifying. Yeah. I, I think Rear Window. Were you a Rear Window fan? Which one? The, the Hitchcock. The, the, the Hitchcock? Yeah. 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 No, it's, it, I mean, like all Hitchcock films, it is, it's very well made, uh, very suspenseful. It's not my favorite of his. It's not one of my favorites of his, but yeah, I mean, it's a good movie. It's, uh, yeah, it's a good one. What about The Mist? Uh, and, yeah, and, the, uh, and the Thomas Jane version. The, the Mist is pretty great. I have problems with the EC Comics ending, but mm-hmm. all, this stuff in the, all this stuff in the grocery store when they're trapped in there, it's fucking great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to put The Mist at, towards the bottom. Were you a fan of The Martian? I am. I am a fan of The Martian, both the book and, and the movie. Um, and I, in fact, in fact we're, Daniel and I are such big fans of, of Andy's work and uh, The Martian that we've, we've done several hat tips to Andy in uh, The Expanse. Awesome. So let's put, let's put The Martian on there. What did you, I'm, a, I, I'm a big Misery fan. Did you, did you, are you a fan of Misery? You should because you're an author, and I'm I, sure... I I'm think, sure there's people that are going to do that shit to you one day. I think Misery is a fantastic film. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did you like the book? Yeah. I mean, it's it. So the book is actually very good. I mean, King is great, but um, I think the movie, because it had to be much more concise and tight, is actually more suspenseful than the book is mm-hmm. because it's it's that movie doesn't have an ounce of fat on it. No, and what's her name's performance? Uh, I'm drawing oh a blank. Oh my god! Uh, uh, yeah. She was so Kathy she Bates. Was, Kathy Bates. Kathy oh Bates. Goodness. And and here's the thing: is is Kathy Bates had been had been in a ton of stuff. I mean, she's been around forever. That movie made her. Oh yeah, that movie launched her. I mean, I think that was the first time I remember seeing. No, no, I re- Fried Green Tomatoes was the first time I remember yeah. seeing her. Yeah, and she and, then, and she'd done other stuff before that too. And that is before shit. What's what's the king? Uh, adaptation with Jennifer Jason Lee as the daughter. Oh, where they push him down the stairs? Yeah, uh, no, into the into the well. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. where she pushes down the stairs. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, dad falls into the well. David Strathairn is in it. Yeah, that um, was after. That was after. Okay, she was a hot shit theater actress too. Like yeah. dominated and then came up or whatever. But but that that performance launched that movie and her career at that it, time it did and because it is so many different things like she's genuinely terrifying at moments but there is a moment in that movie where she's sitting in the chair next to the bed and it's before we know how crazy she is before we know what she's what she's the link she's willing to go to and she's talking about sort of the sadness of her life and why this author matters to her and there is such a sweetness to her mm-hmm. She's so sweet, and you just, wa- you just want to hold her hand in that moment. You just want to pat her on the hand and tell her it's going to be okay. And for that level of just sort of, I, wanted, I just wanted to hug her and tell her everything's okay, that level of sweetness, and then the crazy levels of depravity she goes to later to control him, that's a, that is a tour de force performance. And that's how you write a villain. If yeah. you can write a villain where you truly care and want to hug them one moment and that level of vulnerability and then be terrified of them afterwards, yeah. that is hypnotizing. It's so, yep. it's so interesting to see. Uh, I think it was in Stephen King on writing, but he talks about his original idea for that book. And he, he really uh, he first thought of it as a novella. And same story, author gets picked up by this nurse. He's in the bed. He wakes up. She's there. And basically it was him, it was her torturing him to finish and write this story. And then he does, and at the end, the author's disappeared, the house is nice and clean, and then she has on this, like, basically altar of this author and this tribute and everything, and there's this book, this final book that was made just for her. Yeah. But the cover was made out of his skin. Oh. In the thing. Oh Jesus! And, uh, yeah, 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 and then wow. but we, but he talks. 
the per, the reason he did this is to illustrate how characters start to take a life of their own, and in some ways he just channels it, and the characters you know do things that surprise him all the time. Sure. And he and he says he was so surprised at how resilient Scott Kahn's character was, and what a survivor he was. James Kahn. Oh, uh, James Kahn. Sorry, yeah. James Kahn. And what a survivor he was, and uh, to to make it through that. And I think the ending of the movie is right that that he does get away and he does survive it but he carries the scars of it yeah yeah i mean he's 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 walking with a cane at the end and actually i think in the book she actually cuts his foot off right Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. she doesn't just break his foot she actually cuts one of his feet off yeah yeah i like the breaking better i think the breaking is more violent the visual the visual of that moment literally no one can watch that and not cringe in their chair yeah it's it's pretty horrifying. You know, I think it would be fun to take, you know, on this podcast one time, just take a specific book or movie that we love and talk about the choices they made in making it and why it's so scary and why the and why the, the villain is so interesting and why it's separated and elevated from so many other horror yeah. movies or things like it. So I'm a big fan and I don't I, I don't know I can't remember where you are on this, but I'm a big fan of the others. Um, yeah, I, do, I don't love the others as much as you do. Yeah, I love um, it. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's a very well-made movie. Uh, it's Nicole Kidman, right? Yeah, Nicole yeah. Kidman. Yeah, uh, she's good in it. I mean, it's, the kids are good. The, the two little kid actors are good. Mm-hmm. It's a well-made movie, and I think the twist is well done. Mm-hmm. But I, the problem with it for me as a horror film is it didn't scare me even once. Like it's, oh, it's, really? it's a little, no. it's a little creepy in places, yeah. but it and never I'm, scares and, me. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you're a ghost guy. I don't know. I mean, yeah. you really liked the, uh, the changeling. You really liked the changeling and the that changeling, was very ghost focused. The changeling is great. that the shit out of me. Yeah. yeah the um, changeling is and, great. And I, I'm a big fan of ghost ones. I, I, I love them. You know, I, and the changeling is one of my favorites. And I thought the others had a lot of changeling level moments within it. I thought it was extremely well written. The story was well told. I went along for the ride. I, the reveal was definitely caught me off guard. Yeah. I like how there was this weird kind of magical realism within this house and they couldn't leave and there was a fog and then you yeah. couldn't, and then you, these mysterious workers there and they found these pictures. I just, the movie worked for me. I, yeah. I really thought it was great. No, it's a, it's a really well-made movie. And I remember watching it with my wife and she really liked it too. I don't know. It's sometimes movies just don't work on you the way... They work on everybody else. That one, yeah, uh, it, it never quite reached that level for me. All right, so I so we'll leave three open, three spot, and see what Joseph has, and see if any of those beat the others. All right, what go ahead, got, Joseph. Joseph. All righty, uh, one of my favorite films, The Descent. Oh, that is a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Dead Calm, another favorite of mine. Uh, another another Nicole Kidman. Yep. Yep. I don't know if it counts. I mean, it is confined space, although it is large. The Shining. Yeah, I, I struggled with this one. Well, those are, those are three strong choices. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think, too, because I thought about The Shining a lot. But I guess, it. I mean, look, they're stuck in the hotel. Yeah. So I think it works. If it is, Shining's, Shining's number three. There's no question. And then another recent one that I, I feel as though not enough people saw is uh, The uh, Green Room. With Patrick Stewart. Yeah, no, I know, I know that movie. I actually, uh, I went to one of the premieres of it up in Toronto. So yeah, that one's that one's pretty good. Although they they do get out, and there's a bunch of bunch of the stuff that happens running around outside. Yeah, I think I think The Shining because, but yeah, I mean, because it's not necessarily a confined space, but there's other things on here. I, I I think for this one, I'm leaning toward the ones that really use confinement as a big part of. What drives the story? Like the descent. The descent. You're trapped in a cave. You can't get out of the cave. The, the confinement is actually one of the antagonists. Yeah. Right? So that was, that's a really good one. I, I think Cujo is a perfect example of the confinement is part of the, it's one of the antagonists. Because she's not just confined in the car with the rabid dog outside, but they're in the hot, it's like Arizona or New Mexico, right? Mm-hmm. They're in the hot sun. They don't yeah. have any water. If they can't get out of the car, they're going to die. The kid was like starving to death. Yeah. So I think, I think that using the confinement as part of the antagonism, uh, you were talking about the Ryan Reynolds one uh, where he's buried. 
really uses that where he's stuck in a box underground and he's doing all this stuff to try to figure out how to lead people to him or get out of it. And the only antagonist in the film is the fact that he's trapped. Mm -hmm. Um, There's another one. uh, The, the name of it just, I can't remember the name of, but it's a, it's a movie that came out about 12, 15 years ago uh, has Michael Bean. And it is about a group of people that are trapped underground after some sort of uh, catastrophe, which I, they, I don't know, know that they ever really say what it is, like a nuclear war or a, some other kind of massive attack. And these, The divide. The divide, that's right. And they're trapped underground. And then it's the, the only thing that really initially for the 80%, of, first 80% of the movie is that these people are trapped in here together. And trying to figure out how to survive. And there's limited food. And there's limited supplies. And people jockeying for position to see who's going to get the stuff. I think that kind of movie really fits for me with the, the trapped in a box kind of uh, theme. Although you know, The Divide I, is not a great movie. It's an okay movie. It's not a great movie. Yeah. but yeah. Okay, so Cujo number one. Misery number two. The Descent number three. The Martian number four. The Mist number five. Are you happy with that? I, those are all good movies. Those okay. are all movies that I think are... Quality films and worthy of being on the list, for sure. And, and on theme. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. This was a great time. And uh, please like and subscribe and support us. And, uh, and we appreciate you. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.